The water here is so deep, it's measured in miles, rather than feet. We're in the middle of the ocean in Indonesia, about 40 miles off the coast of Bali. There are thousands of these bamboo rafts floating around out here, and their purpose is to attract fish, like this yellowfin tuna. But moments after the fish swims off, it gets tangled on the rope that's underneath one of those bamboo rafts, which is not really that big of a deal, usually. All we have to do is put a backup shot into the fish, like this. You see all that blood coming out of the fish? That means that his backup shot was perfect. And the fish is secure. At least, that's what I think. That's a marlin. And it's big. This feeling of excitement oh, is soon to be replaced by terror. Not only is it trying to steal my tuna, which has miraculously come back to life with a shocking amount of energy, but the marlin's aggressively putting itself between us and the injured fish. It clearly wants to claim it for itself. My dive buddy, Kadir, climbs up on top of the bamboo raft for safety. I, on the other hand, scream like a little girl for the boat to come and save me. Aye, 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 aye. I don't give a f about that tuna anymore. The only thing going through my mind is putting as much distance between me and the massive hungry apex predator with a giant spear attached to its forehead. A marlin is attacking us for the tuna. Holy shit. It was getting aggressive. How Shakespearean it'd be after all these years of spearing fish to meet my demise by being speared by a fish. Uh, the marlin's stealing it right now. It was, dude, it was about to stab us. It was charging us. Meanwhile, back on the bamboo raft, Kadir builds up the courage to climb back down into the water and face the marlin head on, at which point he proceeds to launch his spear right through its spine. But more on that in just a moment. You see these guys trying to pull this giant cement block into the ocean? Well, the thousands of bamboo rafts that are surrounding the island of Bali aren't here by accident. They're an extremely important part of the fishing culture in Indonesia and they aren't easy to build. Every once in a while, a big group of local fishermen pool together a bunch of money. They buy some cement, bamboo, and a few miles of this thick rope. Then they fill a giant bamboo box with cement, like this, and while it dries, they build the raft. Construction takes about one full day. In Balinese, this thing is called a rumpan, which literally translates to fish home. Anyways, once the cement is dry, the entire community comes together to drag it into the water, by hand, like so. And exactly one eternity later, it's time to attach the cement anchor to the rope, to the rumpon, and drag it out to sea. Many hours later, when it feels like they're in a lucky spot, the fishermen unload the line from the boat, say some prayers on top of the rumpon, and release the anchor. That is how each and every one of these thousands of rumpons got out here. Speaking of which, you see these birds flocking around in the sky? Well, usually underneath these flocks of birds are fish. Like this school of mahi-mahi. That right there is a holding shot, meaning that the fish is not going to break free. Mahi-mahi are some of the fastest growing fish in the ocean. They can grow to be over 20 pounds in just one year which makes them one of the most sustainable fish you can possibly catch. Having said that, I doubt that a statistical analysis of the sustainability of its species is on the mind of this unlucky fish. Anyways, remember how I mentioned that my buddy Kadir spears that marlin? Well, before we get into that, I first want to thank the sponsor of this video, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome top shelf goods from under the radar brand. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. Every month, they introduce their members to cool new products such as outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more. All based on a preference quiz that you fill out online. They can even send you live oysters. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. You can also preview your box before it ships to decide if you'd like to either keep it, swap it for a different box, 
or skip the month entirely for no extra charge. You only pay for what you want. One of the coolest boxes is the Weekender, which is actually not a box as much as it's a bag. Inspired by the bags stonemasons used to use to carry their tools around back in the day, it's been refitted for the modern world. Another awesome box is the Retreat Box. In that one, you get an on-the-go hammock and an on-the-go blanket, both of which fold up extremely small so it's easy to travel with them. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter Aquatic Apes 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash aquatic apes 20. Thanks again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. You see how my spear penetrated this mahi mahi right behind its pectoral fin? That's a perfect shot. My shot placement on this wahoo, however, is not so perfect. At this point in time, it's very important to let the fish swim around as much as it wants. Because if I yank the fish up to the surface while it still has lots of energy to squirm around, it might break free. So I loosen my reel and pull up very gently. But it has a sudden burst of energy, which would be fine normally if my line wasn't tangled around my foot. The sudden jolt of the line being stopped by my foot was enough to pull the spear right out of the fish. Not many things are more disappointing than this. You see the school of yellowfin tuna? Well, moments before I see these fish, my buddy Kadir sees yet another tuna, marlin. Tuna. marlin. This is a pretty special opportunity. It's extremely rare to see hundreds of tuna schooling right on the surface like this. And I do not want to f*** it up. Okay, I just f up. My shot placement is very low. And as the fish swims off, two contradictory things are going through my mind. On one hand, I need to let that fish swim around as much as it wants until it gets tired so that my spear doesn't tear through its flesh again like with that wahoo. But on the other hand, I'm afraid that that other marlin is gonna try to steal my catch again. So I have no choice but to pull the fish up to the surface with a lot more force than I normally would have. After a few minutes, we finally see the fish. Thank God. But as Kadir prepares to dive down for a backup shot, my worst fears are realized. Saya sudah tahu tidak bagus shot. Words cannot describe how upset I am. But I'm gonna try anyways. You see this bite of nigiri? It's made from the belly section of a tuna. In Japanese, it's called otoro. Sort of like wagyu steak, a tuna's belly section is extra fatty and it just melts in your mouth. Melts in your mouth. It's one of my absolute favorite foods, but I don't get to eat it very often because it's incredibly expensive. Here at Sushi Cohen in Bali, it costs about $12 per bite. Basically, this is the most expensive part of the most expensive fish on Earth. $12. I've been coming out to these room ponds for years and have never seen a school of tuna like that. And not only do I not get to eat the fish, but I'd be shocked if it survives much longer out here in the wild with a giant spear wound through its gut. However, not long after I lose that fish, I get a chance at redemption. I cannot believe my luck. Another tuna, even bigger than the last one, swims right up to me in point blank range. And I fucking missed a fucking again. I don't know what's wrong with me. Shortly after that, I see a wahoo. You see how the fish is shaking uncontrollably? Well, that's a perfect shot, right through the spine. But the slip tip on my spear doesn't engage and it slides right out of the fish. What the f I stoned it! God damn it! I need to regroup. I can't carry on like this. Meanwhile, as I stuff my face with rice, Kadir shows us how it's done. For him, spearfishing isn't just a hobby. It's his lifestyle. It's how he provides for his family. 
and he's a true professional. Most of the locals around here fish normally with a line and bait. He, however, has spent years honing his freediving and spearfishing skills, and now is one of the deadliest fish assassins in Bali. I rarely see him hop back on the boat without a fish dangling from his belt. For instance, there are tons of wahoo around this rumpa, one of which I spear and proceed to spend the next 10 minutes battling the fish before finally securing it. Meanwhile, Kadir spears one as well. Only his shot placement is a lot better than mine, which allows him to pull the fish in faster, secure it, reload, and continue hunting. In the time it takes me to catch just one wahoo, he's already got three. <laughs> you got wahoo. He's not just getting wahoo though. He's seeing these schools of tuna as well. <laughs> but he chooses to spear the smaller ones like these because he doesn't want the bigger, more powerful ones to swim off with his spear gun. <laughs> you see this plastic pipe that I'm throwing? Fish love this thing. They usually race each other to get to it. And the winner loses. The plastic pipe slowly sinks, which I retrieve after making sure that my shot placement is good, and then proceed to battle the fish. I always feel a weird mixture of excitement and sadness when securing a catch. And I always end its suffering as quickly as possible. Anyways, as you can see, this little plastic pipe is incredibly effective at luring in fish. After spearing this one, the other fish in the school swim around to see what the hell just happened. I don't know if they're friends with that fish, or trying to eat scraps of its flesh, or maybe they're just curious in the same way that humans are curious when there's a car accident on the highway. Anyways, as much as I like to catch and eat mahi-mahi, tuna are still on my mind. It's a bit of a journey to get out here. After waking up at 5 a.m., we motor out for about three hours, stopping only to pee. There's no cell reception where we're headed. Our only lifeline is the spare engine on my boat, and the fact that our loved ones back on the island expect us to be home later. Sometimes, the rumpons are completely empty. You never know, though, until you make the long journey out here to check. And tuna are extra rare. You see the lights on these local fishing boats? That's how the local fishermen usually catch tuna. Ah. These guys just got back to shore after fishing all night long. They use those lights when it's dark to attract the tuna up from the depths. And they're pretty successful at it. Every once in a while, they land a big one. The big ones are extra valuable because that fatty belly section that I mentioned before is even fattier on a big fish like this. But for us Spiros, all we can do is wait on the surface in the daytime and rely on luck. Speaking of luck, I see yet another school of tuna. And this time, they're even closer. You see that trail of blood coming out of the fish? That means that my shot placement is good, finally. But I can see that my slip tip is still attached to my spear, just like with that wahoo, which is not good. The fish bolts off to the depths, my reel screams, and so do I. This fish is bigger than I thought, and I'm worried that it'll rip my spear gun from my hands when the reel runs out of line. But the boat throws over a float just in time, and the tuna takes my gun down into the depths. It pulls and pulls for what seems like hours. I don't want to yank it too hard for fear of losing another one. And I'm worried about my slip tip not being engaged also. Yellowfin tuna never actually stop swimming for their entire lives. They can travel more than a marathon's distance every single day. And they're one of the fastest fish in the entire ocean. Basically, my point is, these things are super athletes. My real line is about 70 meters long, and there's another 30 meters of line attached to the float. Eventually though, the world's most anxiety-inducing game of tug of war finally begins to slow down. And we see the fish. Oh! <laughs> 
<laughs> By the way. <laughs> Little do we know, the biggest tuna of the trip is still yet to be caught. There goes my little plastic pipe again. And as I dive down to retrieve it, another school of tuna swarms around me, almost as if they're racing to get to me before the others in the school. Right through the spine. A perfect shot, or so I think. Despite the fact that I just severed its spine with a giant metal spear, it still swims off pretty fast. I'm not worried about losing it this time though, so I pull it in fairly quickly. Tuna, tuna, tuna. In sort of a cruel, ironic turn of events, the smaller fish that this tuna would normally hunt swarm around its body, trying to eat scraps of its flesh. Kadir doesn't even go down for a backup shot, although he should have. Because once I have the fish in my hands, I realize that my spear didn't even penetrate all the way through its body. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Oh. Almost lost. Yeah. <laughs> Very lucky. Very oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Young Bazaar. And finally, the fish is secured. As I bring the fish, it coughs up its last meal. A belly full of baby squid. As its warm blood rushes from its body, I feel that same sense of excitement and loss. On one hand, I cannot wait to eat the sashimi from this thing. Not a single piece of it will go to waste. And you can't buy fish this fresh. But on the other hand, this is one of the most beautiful animals I've ever seen. And I just killed it. It's kind of weird that it's so enjoyable. But it is enjoyable. And not just because I've just secured thousands of dollars worth of sashimi. Wow. It's enjoyable for reasons beyond that. Before this tuna fatefully came up to me in the water, it had been swimming around the ocean for years. Each and every one of these rumpons is a mini ecosystem. They're home to thousands of tiny fish, which attract bigger fish who want to eat them, and those bigger fish attract even bigger fish, and so on and so forth. At the very top of this ecosystem are humans, or marlins, depending on the situation. Speaking of which, after that marlin charged us and attacked the tuna, I swim faster than I've ever swam before, while screaming louder than I've ever screamed before for the boat to come and rescue me. Oi, oi, oi! Meanwhile, Kadir builds up the courage to leave the safety of the room pond and grabs a bigger spear gun to hunt the marlin with, which is still circling around the boat. I pull the tuna in, which is completely covered in scars from the bill of the marlin, and as I admire my catch, Kadir is face to face with that marlin. One spear against another. Here's what happened. Okay, so what happened with the marlin after I got on the boat? Okay, teman nembak tuna besar, uh, kaget. Ada marlin besar sekali datang. Enak panik. Aku langsung naik rumpon. Lalu aku panggil teman dijukung. Aku ambil gun lagi dan Aku tembak terlalu besar itu Marlin sampai panah dan akhirnya Marlin pergi kabur. Tapi aku luar biasa takut sekali lihat Marlin sebesar itu sumur hidup aku baru sekali ini lihat Marlin sangat besar. Tapi terima kasih Tuhan Marlin itu sangat agresif galak sekali <laughs> luar biasa takut panik tapi seneng pengalaman yang sangat luar biasa. Terima kasih Tuhan telah menyelamatkan aku. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Kadir. Terima kasih, Lady. Saya berbicara ke orang YouTube. Teman saya tidak punya marlin besar, tapi dia punya marlin topi. Marlin topi. Lebih baik, ya? Yeah. Yeah. Available on aquaticapes.com. Yeah. <laughs> Terima kasih, Kadir. Thanks. All these fish were caught over the course of a few days. Look at all these fish. Neither Kadir nor I have ever seen so many fish at the rum ponds before. By the way, if you're in Bali and want to go spearfishing with Kadir, send me a message on Instagram and I'll happily share his WhatsApp number with you. 
Anyways, while it is sad that that big, beautiful marlin was fatally wounded, Kadir had no choice but to try and catch it. He is a commercial fisherman after all, and a catch like that would sell for a lot of money at the market. Speaking of which, <laughs> back on shore, Kadir is a hero. Wow. Big eye, man. His entire extended family comes out to inspect the catch. We pose for photos, tell stories, and divide the fish. For a commercial Spiro like Kadir, this is a very good haul. My fish, however, are priceless. At least to me. Back at home, it's time to process the fish. Honestly, this wasn't that bad. This one was pretty good. Yeah, you did a great job. We save all of the belly sections, along with as much tuna as our freezer can possibly hold, and then proceed to give thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tuna to friends, neighbors, and anyone who wants some. The heads and spines of the tuna go to the kind, albeit confused, construction workers next door. And even the local police come by for some fillets. Tuna! Ikan bagus! Fresh fish! Tingy! Oh, and obviously my cats get the lion's share. And now, it's finally time to eat copious amounts of tuna sashimi. This is not staged at all. Look at the fat on this belly section. Look at how springy it is. Look at how it kind of just falls apart. This is the most delicious thing I've ever eaten in my entire life. Mm, that is so good. And not just because it's fresher and cheaper than what any sushi restaurant could offer, but because I went into the wild and caught it myself.